Hi, my name is Martin Maas and I'm a research scientist in the Google Brain team. Today I'd like to tell you about some work that we did in applying machine learning to memory allocation in C++ workloads. This is work with my collaborators Dave Anderson, Michael Izzard, Mohamed Mahdi Jevenmart, Catherine McKinley, and Colin Raffel. Using two megabyte huge pages instead of the traditional four kilobyte pages can have a significant impact on application performance due to a reduced number of TLB misses. For example, previous work has shown that workloads can speed up by up to 53% from entirely switching to huge pages. However, huge pages also have an impact at the application level. For example, we saw that C++ workloads can spend half the memory in fragmentation when used entirely with huge pages. This fragmentation has many different sources, but in this work we focus on one specific type of it, which is fragmentation in workloads with highly varying memory footprint, such as servers. To understand where this fragmentation comes from, we need to have a look at how C++ memory allocation works. When your C++ program is calling new, the memory allocator places the object somewhere in memory, and once it has been placed, it can't be moved anymore. Then at some point, the program calls delete, at which point the object is freed. The time between the new and the delete call is typically called the lifetime of the object. A challenge for most memory allocators is that they can only manage memory at the granularity of pages which means that you can only return a page back to the operating system once all objects within it have been freed. So how does this cause fragmentation in workloads with highly varying memory footprint? Imagine a workload that uses about two pages worth of memory, which then drops to just one page. If all of the objects are short-lived, like in this example, this is not a problem because the second page will drain quickly and can then be returned to the operating system. However, what if you had a long-lived object? If that object was placed in a page that's otherwise full, this is okay as well, because this page couldn't be returned to the operating system either. But what if the memory allocator places the object on a page that's otherwise entirely free? In this case, this entire page needs to remain assigned to the application and can't be returned to the OS. This means that we waste about half of our memory to fragmentation. But how bad is this problem really? It turns out that it's actually not much of a problem with four kilobyte pages. Let's assume that one in 10,000 objects is long-lived then you can calculate the probability that a given page contains a long-lived object to be around 0.6%. So it's fairly low, and not much of an issue. This changes completely, however, when you switch to huge pages, because these probabilities increase exponentially. With the same 1 in 10,000 probability that an object is long-lived, the likelihood that a given page contains a long-lived object is almost 100% when you use huge pages. And this means that if your program has been running for a while, it has a fairly high chance that most of its pages contain at least one long-lived object and can therefore not be returned to the operating system. And this is not just a hypothetical problem. We collected a trace from a Google server workload running against a sequence of synthetic inputs that cause its memory footprint to fluctuate frequently. What we see is that the fragmentation with four kilobyte pages shown in yellow is relatively low, but once you switch to two megabyte pages, the fragmentation becomes a large fraction of the memory footprint and is slowly increasing over time. The reason are long-lived objects allocated at peak memory footprint, which keep pages assigned to the application and over time prevent them from being returned to the operating system. This is fundamentally a difficult problem for memory allocators to solve, because solving it requires the memory allocator to know at the time of allocation what the long-lived objects are. Without this information, it has no way of preventing the long-lived objects from ending up on different pages, which causes the effect that we just saw. And there is a large number of long-lived objects. In this workload, about 1% of all objects allocated were long-lived, which translates into thousands of them. Fortunately, there has been quite a bit of previous research on predicting the object lifetime at the time of allocation, and it has been shown that the stack trace when you allocate an object is a good predictor of the lifetime of that object. This has been used in managed runtimes like Java Virtual Machines for tasks such as pre-tenuring. However, this work differs from our scenario in one important way. It is best effort. You don't need to make a prediction for every single allocation, but instead you can simply exploit the stack traces that you know and not make a prediction for everything else. In contrast, we need to make a good prediction every single time we do an allocation, and we need those predictions to be relatively correct. Specifically, there are three challenges to make this work. First, to make a prediction for every possible stack trace, you need to have observed all possible application behavior, which means that you can't just run a micro benchmark or a small test, but you need to actually observe the application in production. 
And recording every single allocation in a production workload can be prohibitively expensive and add easily 10 to 20% of overhead to the execution runtime. But even if we had a full set of stack traces, it wouldn't be stable because applications change over time and even modest changes to the code base cause stack traces to not match anymore. And finally, memory allocators need to make the decisions typically within tens of nanoseconds, which is shorter than it takes to run even a simple stack-based predictor. In our work, we address all of these challenges. Instead of collecting all possible stack traces, we instead introduce a sampling-based approach that only records a subset of the allocations, but at a much lower cost. This gives us a potentially incomplete set of stack traces. Because the set is potentially incomplete, we can't use it to make predictions directly. Instead, we introduce a machine learning model that learns from these stack traces and makes predictions for potentially unseen stack traces at the time of allocation. And finally, instead of running this model every single time when we do an allocation, we instead introduce a caching approach that allows us to cache previous predictions and look them up very cheaply. The result is a system that uses machine learning to predict object lifetimes at the time of allocation and uses them to reduce fragmentation. In this talk, I first want to show you how a machine learning based lifetime prediction approach works. I then like to show you a fundamentally new type of memory allocator that takes these potentially imprecise predictions and uses them to reduce fragmentation. To our knowledge, it's the first memory allocator that is entirely built around lifetime classes instead of size classes. And finally, I would like to show you an end to end prototype of this memory allocator and how it reduces fragmentation in server workloads. So how does our machine learning based lifetime prediction approach work? At a high level, the approach is very similar to profile guided optimization. You're running instrumented servers that collect samples which consist of stack traces and their associated lifetimes, and these samples go into a database. Then you use this database to train a model that maps stack traces to a predicted lifetime. This model is then compiled into C++ code, linked into the application, and runs directly on the CPU within the memory allocator. So how does this approach work? Let's start with our lifetime profiler. Our mechanism is based on an open source tool called pprof, which was developed at Google. pprof connects to servers for brief periods of time during which it collects performance profiles. In our case, we sample a subset of all malloc and the associated free calls during the sampling period and report back the stack traces as well as statistics about the lifetimes. Now that we have a data set of stack traces and their associated lifetimes, we would like to use this data to make lifetime predictions at runtime. The first thing we might try is to compare the return addresses in our current stack to return addresses we've seen in our data set. However, this is unlikely to work because even if you run the same binary multiple times, the return addresses are going to be different. So the next thing we might try instead is to not look at the return addresses, but look at the symbolized stack traces. So things like the function names and the tokens. Those will be stable between two different runs of the same binary. However, it turns out that they are not stable between different variants of the same application. For example, applications get changed over time, and we looked at two different versions of an application that were built from code snapshots taken one week apart, and we found that only 58% of the stack traces actually match between those two versions. If we take versions that are five months apart, almost no stack traces match. There are also different in compile time options. We compared a optimized and a non-optimized build of the same application, and we also saw that few of the stack traces matched. We therefore need a more complex approach to make predictions for stack traces we haven't seen before. Our key insight is that stack traces have a lot of similarity to natural language. Tokens are like words, and stack frames are like sentences. We can therefore apply natural language models to these inputs and use them to predict lifetimes. Specifically, our approach is based on LSTM neural networks, which take a sequence of tokens as inputs and are trained to predict the lifetime of the allocation as output. This allows us to generalize both to stack traces that were not in our initial training set, as well as to stack traces that differed between different variants of the same application. However, running this model every single time you do an allocation would be prohibitively expensive, since the model takes orders of magnitude longer than an actual allocation. We therefore don't run it every single time, but instead we calculate a cheap hash that is composed of the return address as well as the height of the stack in bytes, and we use that to index a hash table. Only if there is no entry in the hash table do we collect the entire stack, pass it to the network, make a prediction, add it to the hash table, so that next time you see the same allocation, you can simply look up the result in the hash table.
So now we have a way to predict object lifetimes at the time of allocation. However, this alone wouldn't reduce fragmentation. So how can we use these predictions that can potentially be imprecise to improve fragmentation in C++ workloads? To this end, we introduce a new type of memory allocator that's specifically designed to consume these potentially imprecise predictions and use them to reduce fragmentation. We call this memory allocator the Learned Lifetime Aware Memory Allocator, or LAMA for short. LAMA is the first memory allocator that's entirely built around lifetime classes instead of size classes. A lifetime class in this case is a particular range of lifetimes such as smaller than 10 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds to a second, and so on. In addition to being built around lifetimes, our allocator is also built around huge pages, which means that it only allocates huge pages from the operating system and only returns huge pages to the operating system. And finally, like most memory allocators, our allocator consists of a small object allocator that handles objects smaller than a kilobyte, as well as a global allocator that manages the spans that back these small object allocators, as well as larger objects. In this talk, I'll only focus on the global allocator and would like to point you to the paper for details about the small object allocator, which is based on IMEX. The way that our allocator works is that it enforces a key invariant. Each huge page has a lifetime class attached to it and only contains objects that are predicted to be at most this lifetime class. So how does this work in practice? At the time of allocation, you predict the lifetime class and then use this to identify the page that the object would be allocated into. Pages are divided into eight kilobyte blocks. And in the beginning, you simply append the current object to the last page in a particular lifetime class using bump pointer allocation. Note that this represents the logical layout of the heap and not the physical layout. Over time, objects will free up and you'll end up with gaps between these initially allocated blocks. When a page frees up completely, you can simply return to the operating system but in many cases, you'll end up with pages that have some live blocks in them, but are free otherwise. If we didn't use those free blocks, our memory allocator would incur a significant amount of internal fragmentation and not be effective. So we need to reuse these blocks. The way that we do this is by keeping track of the blocks that were initially assigned to a page, which we call residual blocks. We keep track of these blocks in a bitmap and show them with dots in this diagram. The key idea is now, that we fill the gaps between these residual blocks with shorter lived blocks. For example, if you consider this one second page with two residual blocks of lifetime one second, we fill the gaps with objects of lifetime 100 milliseconds and 10 milliseconds. And we do this everywhere. This gives us a very nice invariant because we know that if all of our predictions were correct, every page will now live for at most 1.1x its original lifetime class. For example, a one second page will live for at most 1.1 seconds. So at some point, all the residual objects within a page will have gone away. And we know that at this point, everything that's left within the page is of a shorter lifetime class. So in this example, we see that all the one second objects are gone and everything else that's left lives for at most 100 milliseconds. And we know about this because we kept track of the residual object on that page. So at this point, we can reclassify this page as a 100 millisecond page because we know that everything that's left lives for at most 100 milliseconds. And all the objects that were left within it become the new residual objects. And then the process repeats. We fill the gaps between these now 100 millisecond residual objects with 10 millisecond objects. At some point, the 100 millisecond objects go away, at which point we can reclassify the page again to a 10 millisecond page. And at some point, those 10 millisecond objects go away as well, and the page can be removed. So what this means is that every page eventually gets drained and returned to the operating system while still making effective use of all its free memory. However, this approach only works if all of our predictions were correct. So how do we handle mispredictions? This is where the invariant I mentioned earlier becomes important, that every page lives for at most 1.1x its original lifetime class. This means that if we see a page that significantly outlived its original lifetime, we know that there had to be a misprediction. The way we detect this is by setting a deadline for every page, which is currently 4x the original lifetime. And if that deadline is exceeded, we know that there was a misprediction and we can respond to it. The way we do this is that we take the page and we reclassify it as the next higher lifetime class. For example, if you have a 10 millisecond page and you observe that it has lived for 40 milliseconds, you reclassify it as a 100 millisecond page. This way, all pages eventually end up in the right lifetime class and we can tolerate mispredictions. 
So I would now like to show you a prototype that we built of this memory allocator to demonstrate its effectiveness. I want to point out that this is a research prototype and not a production allocator. So it is not tuned and it is not run in a production setting. We implemented our allocator as a drop-in replacement for TCMLLOC, which means that we can run it with real C++ workloads. To build the allocator, you have to collect lifetime data, train a model against it, and then compile this model to be run directly in the application. There are a lot of details how to make this work, including how to handle alignment, how to handle synchronization, or how to handle C-style allocations. And I would like to defer to the paper for this. And with this allocator, we can now take entire C++ Google servers and actually run them in a research setting. Once again, I want to point out this is purely a research experiment and not a production deployment. So let's see what this looks like in practice. Here's a trace from an image processing server, which is responsible for resizing images and applying filters to them. We run the server against a synthetic trace of input images of different sizes, which causes its memory footprint to change. Compared to a known huge page aware TCML of baseline, we reduced fragmentation in steady state by 43%. We also ran similar experiments with three other servers, and we observed fragmentation reductions in steady state by 19 to 78%. We also evaluated the performance of our model, and we showed that our model can generalize to stack traces that were not in the training set, and it can generalize both across different compiler settings, as well as across revisions of a workload that were several months apart. Finally, we wanted to understand how well our memory allocator works independently of the performance of the model, and we see that Llama is able to achieve less than 10% of fragmentation when given perfect lifetimes by a lifetime oracle. And this is entirely with huge pages. So Llama does a very good job at packing memory into huge pages. So in conclusion, we showed how to reduce fragmentation in C++ workloads running entirely with huge pages by combining machine learning with an entirely new kind of memory allocator. We think that some of the ideas from this paper apply beyond the specific scenario that we looked at. We, for example, showed that you can predict object lifetimes from symbolized stack traces, but we think that this might apply to other properties as well. We also introduced the first memory allocator that's entirely lifetime-based, and these lifetimes don't necessarily have to come from machine learning. So we believe that this allocator might be useful in other scenarios as well. And finally, we show that you can cheaply run a machine learning model within runtime critical components of a system by caching the results. So in conclusion, we believe that this work makes contributions both to memory allocation and the broader field of machine learning for systems, and we think that these ideas can be applied to other areas as well. So if you're interested in chatting about any of these topics, please shoot me an email or find me on the Slack channel.